Due to the limitations of darkness, cold, and high pressure, most deep sea areas are unexplored by humans. In the depths, where human hands mend what's broken. Coral reefs are like busy underwater cities, home to a quarter of ocean life, and hiding valuable medicinal discoveries. The ocean mourns, half of its colorful coral has vanished due to different factors. And sadly, the future holds the prospect of even greater losses. Despite their training, accidents still happen, making human divers' jobs extremely hazardous. Here's where Cambria and our technology community step in to make a difference. Would you like to build a future for marine conservation? If yes, let's join Cambria Underwater Conservation Robot DAO. Our approach to build the DAO would be four phases. Phase 1 is to develop the underwater conservation robot solution. Phase 2 is to implement the solution. We can introduce it to underwater conservation service partners to buy or rent as an alternative method. Or the DAO will run donation campaigns to call for supporters to buy the robots and donate to service partners. In Phase 3, we will create community movement with DAO gamification, such as Reward DAO members, reward supporters, reward Ecomarine heroes. In Phase 4 we will speed up the work via community. The Ecomarine heroes at each country can team up to implement cleanup service at local, and we will have annual global prizes for best teams. If you are experienced in R&D underwater conservation robot, or similar solutions and interested in collaborating with the DAO, as dev team partner to develop the solution. Visit our landing page to submit, and stay updated with the latest news. The development work of the DAO technology solution will be reviewed, and approved by a judge committee of four members, two technical experts, one business expert, and one industry expert. If you are experienced in doing marine conservation services and interested in collaborating with this DAO as service partners, we would love to have your participation in the solution development phase to suggest your needs and test the solution. Then in the commercialization phase, we can collaborate to implement the marine conservation service using these robots. If you're interested in underwater conservation robot market, here is the figure. The global underwater exploration robots market size is 3,727.99 million US dollars in 2021 and is projected to touch 7,955.61 million US dollars by 2027, exhibiting a CAGR of 13.47% during the forecast period. The DAO as collective owners of the solution will decide and contribute to the commercialization of the solution. R&D and production by dev partner, judge committee and production partners, 65%, sales and marketing by channel partner, service partner and community partners, 20%, DAO organizing, 15%, Revenues from solution sales, services and licensing will be allocated. Expense budget, 75%. Revenue sharing to DAO fund contributors, 25%. Besides that, Cambria DAO has benefit for fund contributors and community partners. Fund contributors will have DAO LP tokens in proportion to their fund contribution. Cambria DAO LP tokens are revenue sharing token which will bring more benefits for DAO members due to 1. The clear relationship between DAO's commercial success and the token value. Another benefit is a predefined income stream to token holders, they will be rewarded instantly at the time of recording revenues. To community partners, some potential collaborations we would like to propose such as collaborations in raising public awareness, we can cross-share underwater conservation actions among our communities. We can also co-organize activities to raise awareness. Or community partner can be a hub of the DAO, partner will lead the DAO community in your hub to participate in the solution commercialization and get paid for the contribution of your hub. We're looking for the development team submission, dev teams present proposals, engage in Q&A, and ignite DAO fundraising. Don't miss the Ocean Explorers NFT collection sale too, buy NFTs, contribute funds, and secure DAO LP tokens at up to 20% discount. Dive into the future with Cambria DAOs where innovation meets underwater conservation. Join us in safeguarding marine life, rewriting the narrative of our oceans, and charting a course towards a sustainable tomorrow. Due to the limitations of darkness, cold, and high pressure, most deep sea areas are unexplored by humans. In the depths, where human hands mend what's broken. Coral reefs are like busy underwater cities, home to a quarter of ocean life, and hiding valuable medicinal discoveries. The ocean mourns, half of its colorful coral has vanished due to different factors. And sadly, the future holds the prospect of even greater losses. Despite their training, accidents still happen, 
making human divers' jobs extremely hazardous. Here's where Cambria and our technology community step in to make a difference. Would you like to build a future for marine conservation? If yes, let's join Cambria Underwater Conservation Robot DAO. Our approach to build the DAO would be four phases. Phase 1 is to develop the underwater conservation robot solution. Phase 2 is to implement the solution. We can introduce it to underwater conservation service partners to buy or rent as an alternative method. Or the DAO will run donation campaigns to call for supporters to buy the robots and donate to service partners. In Phase 3, we will create community movement with DAO gamification, such as Reward DAO members, Reward supporters, Reward Eco Marine Heroes. In Phase 4 we will speed up the work via community. The Eco Marine Heroes at each country can team up to implement cleanup service at local, and we will have annual global prizes for best teams. Conservation Robot, or similar solutions and interested in collaborating with the DAO, as dev team partner to develop the solution. Visit our landing page to submit and stay updated with the latest news. The development work of the DAO technology solution will be reviewed and approved by a judge committee of four and one industry expert. If you are experienced in doing marine conservation services and interested in collaborating with this DAO as service partners, we suggest your needs and test the solution. Then in the commercialization phase, we can collaborate to implement the Marine Conservation Service using these robots. If you're interested in underwater conservation robot market, here is the figure. The global underwater exploration robots market size is $3,727.99 million US dollars in 2021 and is projected to touch $7,955.61 million US dollars by 2027 exhibiting a CAGR of 13.47% during the forecast period. The DAO as collective owners of the solution will decide and contribute to the commercialization of the solution. R&D and production by dev partner, judge committee and production partners, 65%, sales and marketing by channel partner, service partner and community partners, 20%, DAO organizing, 15%, Revenues from solution sales, services and licensing will be allocated. Expense budget, 75%. Revenue sharing to DAO fund contributors, 25%. Besides that, Cambria DAO has benefit for fund contributors and community partners. Fund contributors will have DAO LP tokens in proportion to their fund contribution. Cambria DAO LP tokens are revenue sharing token which will bring more benefits for DAO members due to 1. The clear relationship between DAO's commercial success and the token value. Another benefit is a predefined income stream to token holders, they will be rewarded instantly at the time of recording revenues. To community partners, some potential collaborations we would like to propose such as, collaborations in raising public awareness, we can cross-share underwater conservation actions among our communities. We can also co-organize activities to raise awareness. Or community partner can be a hub of the DAO, partner will lead the DAO community in your hub to participate in the solution commercialization and get paid for the contribution of your hub. We're looking for the development team submission, dev teams present proposals, engage in Q&A, and ignite DAO fundraising. Don't miss the Ocean Explorers NFT collection sale too, buy NFTs, contribute funds, and secure DAO LP tokens at up to 20% discount. Dive into the future with Cambria DAOs where innovation meets underwater conservation. Join us in safeguarding marine life, rewriting the narrative of our oceans, and charting a course towards a sustainable tomorrow. Due to the limitations of darkness, cold, and high pressure, most deep sea areas are unexplored by humans. In the depths, where human hands mend what's broken. Coral reefs are like busy underwater cities, home to a quarter of ocean life, and hiding valuable medicinal discoveries. The ocean mourns, half of its colorful coral has vanished due to different factors. And sadly, the future holds the prospect of even greater losses. Despite their training, accidents still happen, making human divers' jobs extremely hazardous. Here's where Cambria and our technology community step in to make a difference. Would you like to build a future for marine conservation? If yes, let's join Cambria Underwater Conservation Robot DAO. Our approach to build the DAO would be four phases. Phase 1 is to develop the underwater conservation robot solution. Phase 2 is to implement the solution. 
we can introduce it to underwater conservation service partners to buy or rent as an alternative method. Or the DAO will run donation campaigns to call for supporters to buy the robots and donate to service partners. In Phase 3, we will create community movement with DAO gamification, such as Reward DAO members, Reward supporters, Reward Eco Marine Heroes. In Phase 4 we will speed up the work via community. The Eco Marine Heroes at each country can team up to implement cleanup service at local, and we will have annual global prizes for best teams. If you are experienced in R&D underwater conservation robot, or similar solutions and interested in collaborating with the DAO, as dev team partner to develop the solution. Visit our landing page to submit, and stay updated with the latest news. The development work of the DAO technology solution will be reviewed, and approved by a judge committee of four members, two technical experts, one business expert, and one industry expert. If you are experienced in doing marine conservation services and interested in collaborating with this DAO as service partners, we would love to have your participation in the solution development phase to suggest your needs and test the solution. Then in the commercialization phase, we can collaborate to implement the marine conservation service using these robots. If you're interested in underwater conservation robot market, here is the figure. The global underwater exploration robots market size is 3,727.99 million US dollars in 2021 and is projected to touch 7,955.61 million US dollars by 2027, exhibiting a CAGR of 13.47% during the forecast period. The DAO as collective owners of the solution will decide and contribute to the commercialization of the solution, R&D and production by dev partner, judge committee and production partners, 65%, sales and marketing by channel partner, service partner and community partners, 20%, DAO organizing, 15%, Revenues from solution sales, services and licensing will be allocated. Expense budget, 75%. Revenue sharing to DAO fund contributors, 25%. Besides that, Cambria DAO has benefit for fund contributors and community partners. Fund contributors will have DAO LP tokens in proportion to their fund contribution. Cambria DAO LP tokens are revenue sharing token which will bring more benefits for DAO members due to 1. The clear relationship between DAO's commercial success and the token value. Another benefit is a predefined income stream to token holders, they will be rewarded instantly at the time of recording revenues. To community partners, some potential collaborations we would like to propose such as collaborations in raising public awareness, we can cross-share underwater conservation actions among our communities. We can also co-organize activities to raise awareness. Or community partner can be a hub of the DAO, partner will lead the DAO community in your hub to participate in the solution commercialization and get paid for the contribution of your hub. We're looking for the development team submission, dev team's present proposals, engage in Q&A, and ignite DAO fundraising. Don't miss the Ocean Explorer's NFT collection sale too, buy NFTs, contribute funds, and secure DAO LP tokens at up to 20% discount. Dive into the future with Cambria DAOs where innovation meets underwater conservation. Innovation campaign to call for supporter to buy the robot and donate to service partner. In phase three, we will create a community movement with DAO gamification, such as reward DAO member with DAO LP token for running donation campaign, reward supporter with an NFT representing their robot and credit for the contribution of their robot. Reward eco marine heroes with DAO LP token for their work and sharing the, their story to the community. In phase four, we will speed up the work via community like the eco marine heroes at each country can team up to implement service at local and we will have annual global prize for the best team. Now, we would like to present our partnership invitation to the community so that we could explore potential collaboration together. SDAO is a decentralized organization. All the work in Cambria DAOs are done through partnership, such as Cambria S organizer is in charge of operation to architect the DAO model, develop smart contract, and run partners, organize DAO activity, and raise funds, so on. That partner to develop tech solution, the committee to evaluate solution, Russian partner to manufacture robot, channel partner to distribute robot, and service partner to implement robotic service at local. In this presentation, we would like to invite partnership 
for solution development phase. First, to depth team, if you are experienced in R&D underwater conservation robot or similar solution and interested in collaborating with the DAO as depth team partner to develop the solution, please submit your proposal by July 8, 2024 to demonstrate how you should be selected. The proposal should show your team profile and relevant experience, introduction of your solution, such as ideation, market research, prototype, and demo, your development plan until the solution is ready for commercialization. Note that the collaboration can continue in multiple product cycles and development progress will be managed monthly as per Gambrada model. And the quotation for your development work. From our fundraising experience, we updated our qualification criteria to align with expectation of potential investors, including the team already have prototype to prove technical feasibility of your robotic concept. Your development plan is within six months to MVP, then the DAO community will join hands to bring it to market. Your quotation for the first product cycle is up to $150,000 including prototype development work. To service partner, if you are experienced in doing marine conservation service and interested in collaborating with this DAO as service partner, we would love to have your participation in solution development phase to suggest your needs and test the solution. Then in the commercialization phase, we can collaborate to implement the marine conservation service using this robot. To community partner, some potential collaboration we would like to propose such as collaboration in raising public awareness. We can cross-share underwater conservation action among our community. We can also co-organize activity to raise awareness such as donation campaign, marine exploration and conservation days. Our community partner can be a hub of the DAO. Partner will lead the DAO community in your hub to participate in the solution commercialization and get paid for the contribution of your heart. For example, these are some projects dedicated to marine conservation service and community. We are grateful for the chance to connect with Worldwide Fund and Ocean Conservation Trust and looking forward to our collaboration opportunity in the future. To fund contributors, we would like to share some highlighted financial information for your reference. The Global Underwater Exploration Robot Market Site is $3.5 billion in 2021 and is projected to touch $8 billion by 2027 with a growth rate of 30% during the forecast period. The Underwater Exploration Robot Market has witnessed significant growth due to the increasing need for advanced technology in underwater research and exploration. With reference to the cost structure of tech companies, especially robotic companies, we define the Dow financial framework as below. The investment or expand budget will be used 65% for R&D and production, 20% for sales and marketing, 15% for operation. And the revenue from solution sales, service and licensing will be allocated 75% for expand budget and 25% for revenue sharing to DAO fund contributors. Let us know if you have any additional collaboration idea and please follow our upcoming event. After the info session today, Dev team will submit their proposal by July 8. Then we will have an online DAO launch event in August for Dev teams to present their proposal Q&A from the committee and community. Then we will kickstart the fundraising campaign for the first product cycle. And our progress update for your reference. For each DAO, we organize an info session with introduction and sharing between Cambria and other projects in the field like this event with the goal to raise public awareness. Then we run our risk campaign to call for robotic team to submit and present their project. The recording are public on our YouTube channel for community to rewatch. And from feedback of potential investors, we are improving qualification criteria
to prioritize so solutions which already have prototype and can develop MVP within six months. We invited technical, business, and industry experts to join just committees to evaluate solutions. This is also a chance for us to expand our expert network. And behind the scenes, we have developed smart contracts to integrate to SDAO, a third-party platform for DAO builder and management, to tailor the design of camera DAO model and enable transparency in DAO transaction. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you and looking forward to our partnership. And let's make this happen together. Yeah. So thank you, Ms. Lin, for sharing. Uh, yeah. So and now it's time for our second section, uh, which is guest talks. Uh, our first topic is ocean conservation and its vital role in shaping a sustainable future. I would like to invite Mr. Roger Maslin to share this topic with us. Uh, yeah, so... Hi, uh, Mr. Mr. Maslin. Mm -hmm. Ah uh, yeah yes. yeah yeah we can hear you now thank you. Can you see um if I go onto the first slide can you see that slide? Yeah yeah we can see the slides okay. now thank you. Okay, okay so um a very I guess a good afternoon to you all um as you say my name is Roger Maslin and uh, it's my privilege to be the CEO of the Ocean Conservation Trust so. Over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to give you a flavour of how we approach ocean conservation uh, through our three programmes. And what we try and do is just create a healthier ocean. So, the we have three core ocean programmes called Ocean Habitats, Ocean Advocacy and Ocean um, Experiences. And the... Ocean Experiences is all about getting people together. We have um, a, uh, we operate the UK's national aquarium called the National Marine Aquarium, where it's a great opportunity to excite people of all ages about the marine space. We also have a significant Ocean Advocacy and Engagement Program, which we call Think Ocean. And it's really to connect people with the ocean, to think about the ocean and see how, how connected people are to the ocean and vice versa. And then thirdly, we have our Ocean Habitat Program called Blue Meadows, which is all about the protection, regeneration and restoration of the wonder plant called seagrass. So... Blue Meadows, at the heart of Blue Meadows, is what we're trying to do is to look at how you protect and restore at scale, not just a little research project, but it's all about scale. So, for those of you who may not be so familiar with seagrass, seagrass is a photosynthetic plant. It's found in coastal waters up to about 10 meters uh, deep but it's found all over the world so certainly um in your uh, in your part of the world there are um there are about 60 species we have a cold water variety you have a slightly warmer wa uh, warmer water variety but it's the ocean's only flowering plant but it's also one of the most valuable habitats uh, in the ocean on the planet because it is, has many important properties. A lot of people um, are increasingly seeing seagrass as a wonderful way to store carbon, and it is good, but the reality is this takes quite a long time. And in fact, carbon storage is only a small proportion of the benefit that seagrass provides. It's more important in terms of the biodiversity that it helps create, in particular, being a key nursery for fisheries. Yes, alone what it can do for other uh, nutrient cycles, whether it's oxygen 
or indeed what it can do to help protect coastlines, particularly here in the UK. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's also one of the planet's most endangered habitats, largely due to human activity. And in the UK, on the right here, we've lost about 90% of our seagrass, really because of those human related activities. So what's the solution? We have a three part solution, which is about protecting what we've got, then trying to restore what we've lost, and then trying to scale our techniques outside of the UK. So the first step is about protection. And the principles here are very straightforward, but in the UK, people really don't know where the seagrass meadows are, and they don't really understand why they need protecting. So a very important part of our work is to involve the local communities, because they will become part of that ongoing legacy, ongoing solution. So it's really important to engage with the communities and really create a, an easy mechanism for the harbour authorities around the UK that control the coasts. So as you can see on the right hand side, we've come up with a, a very distinctive marker boy that alerts everybody to where the seagrass meadows are. And what we're trying to do is to use that same marker all the way around the coasts of the UK so that when a boater goes into a coast or a harbour, they recognise that it is an area to protect. So we started in a place called Falmouth, which is in the southwest, so the, the bottom left hand corner of the UK. We started last year in May. And there we protected the first 20 hectares, working closely with the harbour authority and the local community. But it was a quite an easy and cost effective way of getting corporates involved because you can put their logos and badges on the marker boys together with the other information that the harbour authorities need. But also it provides an easy way for the port authorities um, to really do what they need to do, because part of their um, part of their obligations is to also to make sure that the seabed, the sea floors that they look after, um, are left in better condition year on year. So, this is the southwest of the UK, and this is um, where we are in Plymouth, uh, about round here. And so we've been basic, there's a lot of seagrass all the way around this coast. And so we've been uh, protecting all of these areas over the last year. And our intention is to protect from Land's End all the way through here to the Isle of Wight over the next, over the next five years. So we've protected now 120 hectares and our five year plan is to uh, protect 700 hectares, which is about 10% uh, of the seagrass meadows. We're also using technology um, and we are teaming up with a company called Savvy Navi, which basically is an app on a mobile phone that shows, uh, that shows the charts of the sea. So mariners can look at your charts in, the, in, in, uh, in your boat, or you can use an app on the phone just to show you where the uh, seagrass areas are. The second step then is all about restoration. So restoring what we've lost. And here we're really trying to use technology to mass produce seedlings and try and take away the expensive element of diver cost. So many of the projects in the UK are all about using seeds in one way or another. And indeed, some of our projects are as well. So for example, we take seeds, put them in bags, and then put them on the sea floor. What we've also been looking at is 
new technologies, which is really looking at mats. So if you like a like if you use a doormat and full of uh, full of seagrass, planting that in the sea floor, that uh, seems to have been a better mechanism. And as well, we're also trialing uh, um, basically hydro hydro guns. So if you imagine a diver with this very large um, um, gun that has it's like a big sealant gun that you use to uh, for, to repair to repair a window in a house, but a very large one that can be used full of seeds underwater. And we've just trialed that in the coasts where we are and it is proven to be very successful. So now what we need to do is see whether we can take the diver cost out and mechanize that trailing it behind a, behind a boat. It's fine to do all of the protection work, but what's also important is that we absolutely have to monitor the impact of our intervention. And for each of our protection sites, we monitor the amount of uh, seagrass that's been growing. We also monitor the amount of biodiversity uh, that is there in the seagrass, and we monitor the amount of carbon that's been buried uh, in the uh, in the area that has been protected. So we can have a baseline, um, and then we can see over the next five to ten years the impact of the interventions that we're having. I mentioned stakeholder engagement it's really important for us to get the whole of the community on board whether it's those that use the water and the coastal areas either for recreation or for their livelihood or the wider community get them involved at all ages from schools all the way through to uh, old people's homes and then there's the third step which is scaling so once we have proven the concept of restoration at scale, how can we then take that and share our knowledge with uh, other seagrass uh, restoring projects around the world? Because our goal here in the UK is to go from where we are with the 7,000 hectares, so about 7,000 large football pitches. How do we go from there over the next 30 to 50 years to get back to where we used to be um, in the 1930s. So what we're trying to do is provide that holistic solution that delivers that scale of change. The potential is huge. Just if we look at the UK alone and just consider, let's say, the, the fisheries support. In the UK, um, the fishing industry supports 12,000 jobs and about a billion a uh, billion and a half US dollars um, uh, across across um, across Europe. Um, so if we only double the amount of seagrass and, and, and the fish stocks there, you can see the the scale of change that might be um, might be there. Yes, alone the amount of carbon that will be stored and indeed the amount of oxygen that will be generated. So here's our five year plan. So we're trying to protect 10 percent of remaining seagrass, developing that blueprint for scaling seedling propagation um, uh, en masse, and then basically uh, going and restoring the seagrass meadows that um, uh, at all of our protected sites and really trying to share that blueprint um, across, uh, across Europe and the rest of the world. Sadly, we don't have very much time. So as of today's date, we only have 315 weeks to uh, 2030. So if there's anybody on this call that's listening in and, and would like to uh, tackle climate change really as urgently uh, as we do, um, it would be great if you'd like to contact us because all help would be very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Maslin, for your interesting and insightful share. Uh, yeah, so now let's move to our second topic, uh, a decade journey to safeguard Pakistan's marine ecosystems and small-scale fisheries. Uh, we're going to listen to an interesting talk from Mr. Soeb Abdul Razak. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, otherwise, yeah. please interrupt. Yeah. Uh, well, good afternoon and uh, early morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Shraib, and uh, I'm working in the capacity of uh, a marine coordinator. And um, I have a lot of uh, another, you know, cross-cutting hats, invisible hats that comes into my responsibility. So in this talk, within the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to take you through how um, the, the experiences that, you know, how it is crucial to have participatory approach while working with the fisheries communities and what are those positive outcomes. Um, in addition to that, uh, since it is based on my story, so I just added a few slides. Um, so I'm going to take you uh, to a mini tour how we started and uh, stepping into the marine environment. All right. Oh, sorry. I think, wait, here it is. All right. So first of all, I uh, when I was in university, I just joined uh, one of the uh, scientists who were, you know, on the um, on, on the ship for the observation. I joined them there in 2011. In 2012, I had joined uh, WWF as a research assistant on a vessel where we supposed you know, to collect pro biological, environmental, and chemical data. And then that journey started while working with the communities, like, and then, you know, sometimes we had uh, the opportunity to, to work with the uh, monitoring of electronic monitoring and EIS units as well. We used to, you know, to work with the fisher communities by implementing bycatch reduction tools, such as, you know, um, logistics. And I have been involved uh, in rescuing of uh, ETP species, in the, uh, endangered, protected, and threatened species. Um, which includes in you know, dolphins and rescuing the marine turtles. I have been engaged in conducting uh, uh, blue workshops for uh, conducting turtle watch activities where we have developed SOPs by conducting them with the control environment by using red lights. And then I have been in, um, involved in supporting some of our partners, PhD students for uh, for the for the sub uh, for the sampling of mobilids, tissue samples. And I've been involved in it to support some other uh, partners for collecting tissue samples of tuna and tuna-like species, engaged in the surveys for spawning the dolphins. I've been engaged in uh, uh, working closer with the communities. If you look at the left picture, you can see my methods are muddy that we had to, you know, to go and you know, meet those remote uh, communities as well. A picture in the, in the mid is that I've been involved in conducting uh, surveys for uh, around the marine protected areas, engaged in the data collection and uh, uh, training the uh, government offices as well in the data collection and reporting. I've been engaged in the uh, regional um, countries um, scientists, specifically for Arabian handbag network. I've been engaged in delivering lectures in the universities and uh, with a range of audiences. And ultimately, those all whatever I was doing, I used to you know to got the opportunity to uh, to present my work at the at the original level as well. Anyhow, comes in now a story that you know Pakistan's marine ecosystem and fisheries coastal ecosystem the challenges being faced by fishing communities and the marine biodiversity. When you look at the Pakistan, Pakistan's you know uh, easy exclusive and economical zone, which is almost like twenty percent of Indian oceans, where we have you know good vegetation of the uh, four species of the mangroves. We have thirty six species of hard and soft corals, and we do have um, more than twelve thousand you know uh, species marine species. We do have uh, uh, ideally we do have one only green turtles nesting site here, but you know. Um, what, what, what was, you know, that outcome of working with the fishermen, I'm going to you know, mention in the next slides. And we have good population of the uh, mobilids here as well. We say these are, this, you know, their fishing grounds or hot spots. We do have, you know, a dedicated hotspot of basking of the whale sharks as well. We do have seven to eight, you know, uh, species of um, tuna, and 144 species of uh, sharks as well. We do have uh, some hotspots for the uh, whales as, uh, uh, within our waters as well. So the question is, say, it comes there that you know why we need to you know, work for the conservation of uh, uh, megafauna species or ETP species. Since you know um, what I'm going to talk and emphasize in you know, taking case studies as well. So basically, this is a graph where 
um, some of the fishermen reported us on the reporting of entanglement of ETP species, which includes marine trolls, mobile whales, whale sharks, and dolphins as well. And, and, and you know, Pakistan is supposed you know, to report back to regional fisheries organization on five by five grid, which is you know, representing the orange color. So, so hypothetically speaking, that you know, the tuna fisheries, uh, the fishermen use around you know, an average 15 kilometer nets, and there are around 709 fishing boats. For example, if 5% of those tuna, fill, uh, tuna fishing fleet, if they fish in one day, it looked like this dotted line. It would be a wall of death for all those megafauna species, which keep you know, um, migrating from one, one ocean to another, another ocean. So it means that you know there would be a lot of challenges for them. For example, they would be you know the, the, it would result into overfishing. It could get you know the bycatch of the treasure sharks, entanglement of the you know bobolids, and sometimes you know, they get entangled in the ropes as well. And sometimes they get you know entanglement in that and the whole um, net as well. Oh, otherwise they being you know towed down to the to the you know to the coastline, and sometimes you know you can. Um, you can see that you know the, uh, the rolling and bycatch of the whales, and ultimately the dolphins as well. And sea turtles could entangle in the fishing lines, and sometimes in the ghost gears as well, and ultimately in the tuna fishing nets as well. So why we need to take you know um, consider you know the conservation of ETP species? This is basically the picture which is you know, posted by CITES some times ago in 2018, which it says that you know. This picture that it shows that it is composed of many pixel, pixels, which is pixelated, which represent the in number of individuals in the world. So it means that the situation of the sea turtle, for example, is not as good as it's supposed to be naturally, which is included or, or declared as a endangered in the red list, uh, uh, list as well. Since it is CMS uh, uh, species as well, which is a highly migratory species, so every coastal state is supposed you know, to work for their conservation. And establish their, you know, or improve their, you know, data collection and mechanism. Let's take an example that why we need, you know, to take, you know, care of the sea turtles. We consider them as, you know, flagship species when there is, for example, if there is a green turtle, so which, you know, feeds on the vegetation of the sea, they keep limiting that the growth of the vegetation of the sea, allowing the seaside animals to, 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 to find, to, to grow there. So there is a competition for food and shelter. They give them an opportunity to live there and sharing the same uh, shelter. Ultimately what happens, the other species come around, for example, sharks as a ketone species or sometimes, you know, socially important uh, uh, fisheries as well. Ultimately what happens when I'm trying to depict here is that, you know, all these, you know, food waves or food chains are being, you know, being, um, supported by the flagship species, which are green turtles. And what happens is that that's the reason that, you know, they have their ecological, economical, not direct, but long-term, you know, uh, results uh, uh, for, the, for the humans. Just taking a, a few, you know, uh, case studies, what happens is a scenario was set after the scenario, uh, situation is worse, I and mean, especially for the conservation of the turtles. What happens, we came up with, you know, uh, by outreach, again, you know, the fishermen, we work with the more than, you know, 120 fishermen, and our outreach, you know, to coastal fisheries was, you know, more than two, 610 as well, for, you know, you know, outreaching them for the, um, uh, ultimately for the, you know, post-harvest losses and, you know, safe handling and releases of bycatches and overfishing sessions as well. And here we, we, we come with an idea, we train, you know, 20 fishermen as a master trainer for the community who are responsible, you know, for, for you know, conducting the same you know uh, um, uh, same um, uh, trainings to the to the youth as well. So ultimately, we get made a good use of the fishing communities as for as, as, uh, itself as well. Along with, uh, parallelly, we came up. You know, we work with the fishermen closely by you know conducting you know, sessions with them for the data collection and reporting, creating you know, situation uh, scenarios to ensure that you know all those data sheets or log sheets which are being given to them. Uh, they do understand it. And what happened? And then uh, we work with these fishermen. I'm not sure if this video is going to work here, but I was trying to show is that, you know, we used to work. Uh, all right. So while working with this fishermen, this is, you know, the previous practices that, you know, turtle used to, you know, to hold up on the hauler net 
without you know, uh, considering its significance or importance or their conservation. The, ultimately, for the fishermen, anything is valuable which comes in form of fish or bring them you know, some money. So this is they used to do like you know mishandling the troll. They were taking care of their catches, which was more uh, valuable for them as compared to the turtle, which is not anything which can fetch money for them. And you, they used you know to you know to handle it and throw it in the water without any uh, uh, brutally. I mean, what happened? We trained the fishermen, and then then uh, they were being you know trained you know how to engage you know uh, interact with the sea troll. What are those things we need to do's and don'ts? How you supposed to you know to, to handle it? And they started you know collecting data for us for their you know um for the species and you know by 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 recording their length frequencies as well. So basically, this is you know and we have advised them that this is how the way this is the way how the turtle should be you know uh, handled while facing that you know the sea at forty five angle. So this is you know um, interestingly in the in the footage you see that you know it was Olive Ridley which is found in the Pakistani waters as a foraging ground. And in this is, you can see that in you know, the baby turtles of the green turtle have been found in the offshore waters. There was perception that maybe in Pakistan doesn't have all of Ridley turtles after 1990s. Uh, uh, they never used, you know, to uh, visit Pakistani beaches for the nesting. And now this is confirmed that, okay, these species are already there, but, you know, they are not visiting Pakistani beaches. What happens because of their data collection and mechanisms? So this is the data of, you know, those um, early years which shows that, you know, there's a bycatch of Olive Ridley and green turtle as well. And it confirmed that, you know, most of the, you know, uh, turtles which were green were undersized, means there were, you know, uh, sub -earls, and all the Olive Ridleys were, you know, adult turtles. At the same time that, you know, we have came up with the data of, you know, understanding that, you know, the black hole, which was, you know, a black hole of the information from tuna fisheries that, you know, okay, there is a bycatch of the you know, dolphins as well. Ultimately, what happens, you know, in 2015, we came up with an idea, like in here, how the, you know, citizen science can work, that, you know, the idea came up from one of the fishermen from the Western Coast. They used to target yellowfin tuna. And they came, after discussion, they came up that, you know, they have been used, they used in the past, like, you know, lowering their, their nets, which we call them as a subsurface gear. And, you know, thanks to the fishermen, they helped us, you know, to, you know, to demonstrate it. And it, it turned to be, you know, a, a really uh, one of the, you know, low cost technology for reducing the bycatch. And, you know, the significance of this technique is that you know, it is adopted by Indian Ocean Tuna Commission as alternative uh, mechanism by engaging the uh, crews for the data collection and subsurface as a conservation management measures for, uh, uh, for the, as a low cost technology for reducing bycatch, especially for the turtles and dolphins. This is how it works. Let to give you the differences. So the first fisherman, the target cage is yellowfin tuna, long tail, and scoopjack. So what happens in the subsurface gear that those fish, those animals, ATP species, which breach on the surface for the breathing, they get a chance, you know, to escape the net and you know avoid the entanglement. Ultimately, what happened? It resulted like you know we have been noticed that you know there was a, a reduction in number of uh, in in uh, mortality of the of the dolphins. Similarly, you know the question has been raised that maybe the fishermen are exaggerating the data, but you know we have installed some technologies, CCTV camera, you know to confirm and validate all those data they have been collecting. So in this slide, you can see that you know on the left arrow it shows that that's the main line of the of the uh, of the gear. And that the, the second row shows the extension of uh, of the of their you know uh, the gear, which is then around two meters. At the same time, like you know, we have been monitoring some other videos as well. We can see that on the left picture, if you see it, you know, between those fishermen, if I could be able to highlight it, uh, here it is. You know, basically, it is a troll. And this is in this picture shows that how it's supposed, you know, the fishermen, you know, started, you know, handling it by, you know, grabbing it from the sides and release it back into the water. Uh, sorry. Ultimately, what happened to the, this, you know, safe handling release, which was a part product of that project. So till date, you know, from 2012 to 19, they have been able to, you know, to rescue and release around 110 whale sharks, 19 mobiles, 89, 82 sunfishes. And nine dolphins, one propose five whales, and a lot of you know sea turtles as well. 
And by coming that with, the, with that idea, we have documented these you know, safe handling and releases that we have developed it for the small scale fisheries for Indian Ocean fisheries, which includes a range of species like safe, uh, safe handling and releases of the dolphins, of the sunfishes, mobiles, sea turtles, birds, sawfish, and whale sharks as well. This is what I'm trying to show that you know, this is, these are a few steps which are a part of, uh, of this guidebook, which includes, which emphasizes on data collection of of data collection and reporting of such kind of events, like you know, collecting that uh, GPS uh, uh, coordinates, recording uh, those, you know, filming those uh, safe handling and releases, collecting the data, and ensuring that you know to look after if that species have been do do have any tagging satellite tag or flipper tags as well. This is one of those things that you know we have been motivated in acknowledging the fishermen at our original meetings by you know as a as a token of appreciation for those who have been enthusiastic for you know data collection and, and reporting of uh, species, including the bycatch, uh, safe handling of releases. In conclusion, what happens like you know so this is this is hurting to feel that you know these fishermen that uh, nowadays we do 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 receive some of those. Uh, you know, news is, or maybe, you know, um, about the bycatch. So if you can see in the left picture, these are, these are you know, one of those voluntary fishermen which send, keep sending us in such kind of events of about, you know, a stranding of the whales. And, you know, sometimes they voluntary do show us, send us, and so in fact, this is a video, I'm not sure if it's gonna work. So they keep sending us that, you know, um, the videos of their self-handling of releases. Uh, they are like, you know, we're not paying them anything, but they are voluntarily just, you know, sending us, you know, such as uh, reporting us back about the, such kind of events as well. What happens, like in conclusion, like, you know, working with these fishermen, we build a trust with them. And there is the, the most important thing is that there is a, a social behavioral change while treating this kind of, you know, ETP species. In addition to that, we do have length frequency of those species which are uh, being caught in tuna, uh, tuna fishery of tuna species, so tuna-like species, and other you know bycatch species as well. And we do have you know that th this this message is being you know rebounded of safe handling release of the animals, which is which is again you know one of those you know the changes which is happening in the, within the fishermen as well. But through this data, whatever the data is being collected, verified, and being you know communicated to the government of Pakistan, which ultimately reported it back to the IUTC, which is um, original fishing uh, fishing organization, which helped the Pakistanis as a country, you know, to build to, to increase their compliance compliance of reporting back, you know, to uh, to species level from their fishing uh, tuna fisheries, it increased from five percent to almost you know sixty percent. So the outlook and the scaling up of this beast. So what we do look, you know, for um, for scaling up of these best practices. And at the moment, I'm looking at those two projects. You know, we're engaging with the coastal fisheries, and uh, at one we are trying to improve the fishing um, techniques by converting billnets into the long lines. At the same time, um, um, there's another project we are looking for the you know uh, assessment of bycatch of cetaceans from coastal fisheries as well. So these two projects are being based on this you know all those experiences that we had before. Ultimately, we are trying to you know to, so this is the outlook we are trying to you know to move up from you know uh, uh, traditional um, paper based logbooks into the digital ones. The, the application is is you know developed and it is under trial as well, which includes an additional points. And it includes all those minimum requirements which are required for Pakistan itself and for the report to the regional fisheries organizations. And at the same time, we came up with the idea of you know um, a, a prototyping. So this is what we have done it with the Oxford University uh, uh, professionals. So we we tested it that you know, since it was you know one, one of the major constraints like coastal states, you know they never. Um, report back the the, the, the the species catches to species level, but rather they report it back into category. So we came up with the use of you know artificial technology machine learning. And we've been able you know to to you know to work with uh, to train the machine by you know identifying underwater uh, you know sharks you know based on their unique uh, characteristics. So this is something which is you know we are looking you know to do you know to develop it you know and, and test it in the real world as well. So this is basically the idea, like, you know, to developing a software which you can scan the species from the heap 
it could give you, you know, that all those, you know, uh, uh, time stamps and, you know, it could give you that, you know, all those, you know, required information like detected, which, uh, which was the detected cause of the species, what is the length of it, and total number of the individuals. So this is going to be the my, you know, one of the my final slides. So what we are trying to do, all this conservation efforts are being done is just because, you know, we want to go and we want our oceans to look like in the second pictures, although it is horrifying as compared to the, the less one, which is more horrifying where there's no any sharks or no any species. Well, in line with that, I would love you know, to, to acknowledge all those, you know, uh, our donors, Jeff, Common Oceans, FAO, Shark Conservation Fund, ITC, Anglo Foundation, and Oxford University and Shellcatch Technology. Through their career funding support, we were able to, you know, to outreach our fishermen and special thanks to the fishermen who had the trust in us and, and uh, allowed us you know, to, to trial um, and work with them you know, to, to have such kind of positive outcomes. And ultimately, by the end of the day, it is always possible together. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Razak. A uh, vivid pictures and so inspirational with your journey. Yeah, so uh, our next topic is the impact of upcycling on marine conservation from fashion waste to ocean art. Uh, please welcome the next talk from Ms. Mary Dean Lamos. Okay. Good, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Shai, for um, I guess sharing what you're doing in Pakistan. So my heart has been beating while watching your graphics because I used to work in marine conservation for five years. I was managing a team of um, researchers focusing on uh, fisheries of mobile arrays, um, assessing the reproduction. Uh, no, uh, assessing the. Um, the population of um, sharks and sea turtles in the Philippines. So I hear your, um, I guess your hardships, also the success. And I think it's really wonderful that, you know, aside from the Philippines and Indonesia, our countries are also doing the same things, also struggling this, you know, we are fighting to find and ways. And yeah, I think, um, it was really good to hear that because it fuels to my the reason why I'm invited to be in this um um meeting and to present um where I am now and how did I came how did I become a social entrepreneur before coming becoming um because I was a marine bio before so I'd like to explore with you the okay it's working. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I would like to share with you how I explore social enterprise and arts while in marine conservation and how it has led me to discover fashion waste and to empower women of this awareness about what's happening in our marine ecosystems. So um, my topic will be about the impact of up upcycling on marine um environment and what I do, what I did to, you know, to find solution from fashion waste to open art. So I have a question. Have you ever wondered how your pair of jeans is made? Um, like any other uh, man-made thing, it goes into a series of processes. So first one is that first planting cotton in the field, uh, harvesting and transporting them to fabric company companies, then it will be distributed to garment factories where they will be applying dyes, chemical, and produce genes based on brand. The gene will be then distributed all around the world and reach your homes. For a few months, it will be the favorite masterpiece in your trip. And after some time, it will be just one of the hundreds of clothes piling up in your closet or the ones that you give away. But what really is the cost of creating a pair of jeans? Do you have any idea? Okay. So a case study by the brand Levi's, I think uh, most of us are familiar with that. So Re Levi's conducted a life cycle assessment in one of their products to see its environmental impact. And they found out that 
A pair of jeans uses 4,000 liters of water in its entire life cycle. That's about three days uh, worth of one U.S. household water needs. And then they also found, found out that a pair of jeans emits 33.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to 69 miles driven by the average car. If any one of you have a car, you, you probably will know this. And then a pair of jeans uses up to 1,500 kilowatts of electricity. That's about 246 hours of um, watching TV. So you can imagine how many years is that? Or maybe, yeah, how many years uh, now? Crazy. And then uh, what's really surprising is that a pair of jeans requires one kilogram of cotton, and then one kilogram of cotton requires 20 liters of water to produce. So not accounted for is the land use to grow the cotton and then the eutrophication and the pollution a pair of jeans can do. So, oh my God, it sounds so depressing, but I think what's depressing is seeing it ending up in the lands uh, landfills, waterways, and the oceans are, you know, it's really, it's it's sad, like, out of, like, all the, um, I guess, the problems, all the issues being faced by marine animals, plus on top of, like, the waste that we are producing. So, according to the documentary, The True Cost, I'm not sure if you've seen this one, so the world consumes around 80 billion new clothes, pieces of clothes every year, and that it is 400% more than the consumption 20 years ago. So imagine how we buy, we dispose, we buy, we dispose. So the US alone, they throw away up to 11.3 tons of textiles uh, per year. And then that's about 2,150 clothes per second. So that's the US alone. How about the rest of the country? And then just uh, just imagine that in, in, in global perspective, there's only about 12% of the material used for clothing alone ends up being recycled. So let's talk about the environmental impact of um, fast fashion. So fast fashion, they use a cheap synthetic. So if you're like, if you're touching, you can touch your clothes now. It's if it's stretchy, it, it could be the polyester or the nylon. So Every time you you wash your clothes, they also shed tiny plastic called uh, microplastics. And then this microplastic, because they're so small, water treatment plants, if there's even a treatment plants in your area, it's it goes directly to the rivers, to the seas, and to the bottom of the ocean. And then on top of that, when you wash your clothes, there is a discharge of dyes, fertilizers, and toxic chemicals, and it left... If this is left untreated, it leads to water contamination and basically what the water goes to the river, to the spread to the sea and definitely to whatever is living in the sea. And um, there is a case study in India and in, in Bangladesh that uh, dye waste water discharge uh, is maybe linked to a dramatic rise of diseases in these regions according to some of the research um, they've been doing. And um, according to the World Economic Forum, they estimated by 2050, there are more plastic in the ocean than a fish. So can you imagine eating a plastic? So who? I think um, let's just assume all of us eat, eat fish. So assume that you're also eating plastic. So it's so sad, and but I guess that's the reality of it. So microfibers, when they release, uh, they're released from your clothing and other microplastics are sometimes, they are mistaken by food. As I mentioned, they're mistaken by food, by the fish and other marine animals. And this is not only harmful for the animals that ingest it. This is also harmful for the bigger animals, bigger in the food chain and basically including us eating the fish, eating also the plastic. And yeah. Well, the fish has spoken, so what we did, I guess, our team decided to be part of the solution to lighten up the mood of the fish. Like This is, that, this is what we, I guess, this is the reason why we do things that we do. We want to apologize in a way because they, we could never undone what we've done. So 
let's just do something in our own little ways. So we figured out that the waste can be turned into an opportunity and through innovation and creativity, extending the life of fashion waste through community empowerment before the fabric ends up in the landfills, causing environmental um, degradation. So we've created our social enterprise. Um, this, uh, we call it um, Tagpi Tagpi. It's a Filipino word for patching things together. It was initially launched with the intention of providing economic opportunity for underprivileged women in the rural coastal communities. These women have limited access to economic opportunities due to age-old traditions and the norms of them being a woman. And um, basically, as, uh, as the frontliners, they have witnessed the harsh reality of climate change and so how their environment is becoming a waste dump site. And we saw how, uh, how frustrated and they are that they are losing their livelihood. And, and at the same time, we can also see that they are really hopeful for a better future ahead of them, especially for their younger generation, for their kids. So what we did is we provide them with a personal initiative training to introduce them the concept of circular economy and the sustainable business. And by doing this, we were able to give a new lifespan for fabrics by reducing the demand for the new resources and minimizing the environmental impact associated with production and disposal. We also provide them a source of income and business opportunity. They were able to interact with our partners. They are being invited to showcase their products. Unlike before, they were just mothers staying at home. So now they can they were exploring, you know, like talents and skills that they never know they they they, they have. And then we are empowering them that, you know. There are boundless of opportunities in the marine environment. You just don't need to be a wife of a fisherman drying fish. You can be creating products to sell to, sell to tourists. Like um, tourism is the number one industry in most Southeast Asian countries. Philippines is on the, uh, that's like the second top um, source of income in the Philippines. So we really push for um, providing them an opportunity that, you know, uh, to showcase creativity and building a community where we're building a community of um, you women who inspire each other who aspires change who aspires to be part of you know a group of people who are not just up for the money but also up for you know um, bringing something positive for the environment and to their um, community and um, for three years, we are continuously exploring new ways of upcycling. And definitely, we are far, far behind from what other organizations who are, you know, using tech, using um, um, like really exploring a partnership abroad. We are still um, really localized in the Philippines and our method still requires a lot of collab. We're still, you know, looking for more collaboration. We're still looking for progress and innovation and like what matters for now is that we are creating circular um, opportunities for women we see them really happy with their art output we see them um, having knowledge of how plastic is impacting their environment how they their purchases uh, purchases of clothes um, you know can impact the way they think the way they I guess the way they present themselves the way they sell the products now it's it's really personal for them because they have a first-hand experience like most of them don't know how to swim but because of the exposure of like creating these products and we also tried to bring them to the ocean from time to time just for them to to see like you know what are we fighting for like it's always good to put a face on you know like we are the one helping them do this but by the end of the day, they are the implementers. So what we want to explore now is that there are more youth movement address addressing the issue. We really want to work with them. And then we are also working alongside organization in raising awareness about its effect in the marine environment. So what's really important is that when 
when Tagpi Tagpi was created, we really um I guess we really highlight what um SDG goals we are contributing to, like at the for someone who was really um into marine conservation for a couple of years, I think it it you have a common ground before we started that this is what we wanted. This is the SDGs we are strongly supportive. We will be open to other SDGs as well, but this is our this is the expertise we have now. This is the you know this is the knowledge that we have now. So basically, this is the focus that we will be focusing now on, and hopefully, we can explore the rest of the SDGs in the later part. So thank you so much for fish be with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Lamos, uh, for your amazing and interesting share. Uh, yeah, and now I will come to the last share from Mr. Center uh, Yasite with the topic, your motivation and passion when working in the field of underwater vehicles. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh... Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, and you can hear me loud and clear, right? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, well, so everyone's uh, presentations have been wonderful and, and pretty, they had pretty good titles. Mine is, is, is a bit short and it's like my journey and that's it. <laughs> and then I will, I will try to share um, what challenges we have faced and, and, and how we overcome those and, and how we started, how we ended up. Um, let's get started. Um, so who am I? I'm I'm Sanjay. Uh, I graduated graduated from uh, Stanford Technical University with a major in uh, controls and automation engineering. I basically discovered my passion for robotics and 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 joined uh, the IT Robotics Club. Um, and and in there, a friend suggested me that uh, we should be founding. Uh, and our team, uh, and 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 uh, so th this led to uh, co-founding the uh, IT ROV team, which is a remotely operated vehicle team, um, uh, mainly preparing for for a, for a comp competition uh, called Meet ROV, and we founded this in in two thousand and seventeen, and then uh, I later founded the IT AUV team, which is you, you can think of it like the autonomous version of that. So. Uh, Autonomous underwater vehicle team and and uh, in in two thousand and and nineteen, uh, both with the assistance and invaluable guidance of uh, associate professor Bigit Sak, and 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 now both teams consisting of uh, twenty five members uh, up to twenty five members has been successful in developing uh, underwater robots, uh, which was a field that I was initially unfamiliar with. Um, so my journey in robotics has been filled with mostly on, on uh, software development and motion control for diverse vehicles, like including underwater vehicles, surface vessels, also ground and aerial types as well. Um, I've participated in um, various student projects, um, competitions, and, and community events, often spending uh, countless nights uh, troubleshooting what is wrong with our robot. As I mentioned to those teams, my experience has grown, especially in uh, working with control systems and embracing the unique challenges of underwater and open sea conditions. Um, so let me share a bit about um, our, our, our teams. So as you can see, this is a pretty old uh, photo and you can see me uh, pretty young over here. <laughs> um, so this was in uh, 2017. Uh, when our uh, when we had our first prize in 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 IT ROV team, um, uh, getting the first prize at uh, Made ROV Turkey Regional. Um, so we started off with with only uh, three persons and 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 our our mentor as well, and and, and ended up in, in in fifteen of us uh, getting our first uh, prize. Um, at, at the first year. So we were pretty excited. We didn't know anything. Um, literally we had we had we didn't have any know-how and and then um, we were basically um, lacking the knowledge like how do we um, seal our robot and make sure it doesn't 
it doesn't get any water in it, uh, how not to not to fry our electronics. We didn't know anything, but but we all had the same passion. We wanted to be oops, uh, we wanted to be we wanted to be uh, successful in this in this project, and this is what drive us uh, to the end, which which resulted in in having the first place, and. I mean, working in uh, in the IT RV team for about two years, we then um, founded the IT AV team, which again founded as um, as a couple of individuals. Um, but at the end of the year, we were about um, thirty to thirty five people working at, working on uh, autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, well, that year uh, we basically spent. Uh, our 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 uh, our year um, trying to learn about autonomous systems, trying to improve our software skills, and and uh, of course get the money uh, in order to uh, travel to United States because the competition was in United States, so we didn't have enough money and resources to to fund our our uh, technical uh, development. And the very next year. Um, we have finished the development of our vehicle. I can maybe share this video if you can, if you can see it. See it. Uh, this is this was for Singapore UV Challenge uh, submission video. So here you can see uh, full environment. Uh, our vehicle uh, is being tested for the first time, and and uh, it, it looks like autonomous, but it, uh, I can I can assure you it's not autonomous. <laughs> Uh, it's trying to accomplish a couple of tasks, and and this is the first time like uh, we were testing this robot, and and we were very uh, concerned that we will have a water breach, and then which will result in a very bad way. <laughs> but luckily, we didn't have any problems, and yeah, um, this is this is that this is the first time our thrusters was. Uh, journey and yeah uh, this was this was exciting the very next year um yeah oops yeah we, uh, the, the very next year the COVID happened as you as you know it uh but that didn't stop us well it, it stopped us for momentarily because the government in Turkey uh was restricting us from going going outside, and then this was a this was a shocking news for every one of us. And then at that time, we had online meetings. Uh, we we continued to learn, but we weren't able to perform tests, get it together, and work on the robot. Unfortunately, but after some time, when the uh, when the restriction has been lifted, um, the very next day we were at the pole um, and and testing our robot. And this is this is a picture of that. Moving on forward, and uh, so twenty twenty one, uh, we participated in, in Robosap, uh, and at that year we were preparing for Robosap and also the Singapore UV Challenge. But due to the COVID, Robosap uh, has been transitioned into an online competition uh, for that specific year, and and uh, sadly, uh, Singapore UV Challenge has has to be uh, has been uh, cancelled. So we only participated in. Uh, RoboSap Online. Uh, we became the finalists, uh, and and out of all uh, forty nine teams, we we placed fifteen, as I remember. And and this is we're we're at the parking lot of 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 the Faculty of Naval Engineering and Architecture, and then we we were using the projectors uh, to join the Zoom call. Um, and here you can see another image. Um, at that year, uh, we also were uh, flying a drone uh, on 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 our leg uh, in ITU and main campus, and and unfortunately that that drone just fell to the water, and and we started a rescue mission. Uh, we used the AUV and the the catamaran you see over here to search and rescue that drone, and then grab the footage inside of it, uh, but. We, unlucky for us, we weren't able to find it, and, and because the search area was 
too diverse. So yeah, unfortunately we have to let go of that throne. Uh, the very next year, uh, we placed first in the Singapore AV Challenge 2022. Uh, and this was uh, IG AV team's uh, first international attending on site uh, prize. Um, and, and here you can see the robot after like countless nights. Uh, now the, the, the debt is paid off and, and we were quite happy with the result. Uh, moving on forward. Very next year, I started uh, mentoring IT Autobi team for developing unmanned surface vehicles. Here you can see on the left, uh, we have our vessel, uh, and on the right, uh, this is the competition vessel called uh, called Otter. Uh, we were in Norway, um, and we again uh, placed first in the New York Autonomy Challenge 2023, and and uh, we were quite happy as well with how this uh, came out. Um, so in short, who am I? I'm a uh, roboticist, roboticist um, robotics enthusiast. And then and, and this is, uh, this has been, um, th this has been my passion and, and my story um, on, on these student teams. And my message to the community is, is to dive into the future. This was the headline that we had uh, when we when we founded the ITA UV team, um, with this headline, we were we were reminding ourselves that by building um, the technology over here, we must be adding some value to the community. We must be bringing some value to the community, and and uh, this this technology can be used must be used in order to help uh, build a better future for our planet Earth and and uh, and our oceans. Uh, so if you want to check out what the teams are doing right now, uh, here are the links. Um, feel free to contact them. Um, they'll be happy to share their uh, experience with you. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I think that has been it. And thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Mr. Yasutu, for your share uh, with a passionate journey and you and your team's great contributions. Thank you all for sharing with us the insights, your meaningful and interesting journeys. Uh, and now let's listen to Spark sharing uh, my stories from our beloved guests. Uh, first of all, it's about marine conservation campaigns uh, and volunteer projects. Uh, yeah, also Mr. Sensor Yasutu, uh, I would like to invite you to share uh, about this one. Uh, could you please share with us a time when you, uh, either by yourself or with your team, participated in a marine conservation campaign or a marine conservation volunteer project? Sure. Uh, we Back in those times, uh, we didn't know about uh, underwater robotics or like the, uh, marine robotics at all. So we weren't able to target specific needs of the community, but we had to first improve ourselves. But as soon as we did, uh, we joined a couple of uh, events um, by because we had a lot of um, opportunities to to uh, test our vehicle in open sea conditions as well. Unfortunately, the Bosphorus in in Istanbul is is, is you know um, that's too windy uh, for those kind of cases. And it's it's a little bit dangerous as well to be testing uh, these kind of robots in a, in a student's manner. So we, did, we weren't able to uh, do some tests on, on, on the Bosphorus, but um, the, 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 main, uh, the main aspect that we have uh, in order to be able to build a better future is that we wanted uh, to build an exploration robot that can they can map the seafloor they can uh, detect uh, certain uh, biological creatures under under the water it's so it, th this has been our focus and and I haven't been uh, involved in in such uh, in such events uh, deeply because I was more in the technical background and, and how we deliver what people need. And, and, and people have been working with such activities uh, based off the technology that we have developed uh, from time to time. And, and it's really, really uh, good to see 
what you build is being used for um, for valuable uh, works, I can say, or activities. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Like one more time, I so have to say, like lots of like contributions with passions right here. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. So uh, for the next share, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Roger Maslin. He leads the OCT in connecting people with the ocean, promoting uh, pro-ocean behavior, and working towards a healthier ocean, particularly for uh, marginalized voices. Uh, his role involves advancing the mission sustainably on regional, national, and global scales. Uh, so, Mr. Roger Maslin, uh, could you please share the obstacles or troubles that you have overcome or the most memorable moments on the marine conservation journey? Certainly. Uh, um, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it now. OK, so I think from our point of view, um, the key obstacle um, that we see from, let's say, this side of the world in the UK um, is really the simple issue that we've lost connection with the ocean. Um, that's the principal issue that people, unfortunately, have, um, have forgotten their link uh, with the ocean. So what we're trying to do, trying to encourage uh, and make people more ocean literate so basically to have a better understanding uh, of what impact their lives have on the ocean and vice versa and so again there's this concept of a kind of marine citizenship and that is what our uh, one of our three key programs that i explained at the beginning uh, is all about so this is our um, ocean advocacy program think ocean so in essence it's quite straightforward. Conservation is all about people. But what you need to do is create that emotional uh, that emotional connection, that ocean connection. And our experience is all about trying to give people to start experiencing and participating with the ocean. That leads to discovery and learning. And basically, if you learn to love something, you're more likely to care for it and, and act uh, in, its, in, its, in its welfare. So our behavioural pathway is experiencing and participating, getting that emotional engagement, discovery and learning, and then connection and action. And we work both top down and bottom up. We work with governments, we work with the UN in trying to um, improve um, humanity's relationship with the ocean. And then we can use our aquarium, our National Marine Aquarium, um, where we have over 300,000 people per annum. And again, we can help influence their behaviours. But it's all about this connection, whether it's in festivals, it's on the beaches, it's using um, uh, VR headsets, or just getting people just to experience an ocean life. For us, it's all about Think Ocean. So that we'll be running some campaigns over the next um, 18 months or so, again, in the UK, just trying to encourage people to think about the ocean. And then locally, where we are in the southwest of England in the UK, um, the, um, the, the sea area um, called Plymouth Sound has just been designated the UK's first national marine park. So basically, it's a fantastic opportunity of really trying to put the ocean at the heart of a city and try and make this part of the UK a little bit more ocean literate. So hopefully it can all lead to a healthier ocean. The issue is that we've lost connection with the ocean and we need to do make a great effort to try and re-engage people with the natural world. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, your effort. Uh, it's really great like, to let people have chance to connect with ocean and like they have a uh, real experience. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, also for this topic, uh, Mr. Sobi Abdul Razak, uh, on the journey of marine conservation, working in marine programs uh, or when working with the small scale fisheries, do you have any obstacles or troubles that you have overcome or any memorable moments? Uh -huh. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, exactly. Uh, I'm a bit confused to how to answer it since, you know, there are different ways to answer it. From Fishy's perspective, yes, uh, I believe there are a lot of uh, obstacles. You know, uh, there is a need of improving monitoring, surveillance, and compliance. From management perspective of fisheries to local level while ensuring the livelihoods of the fishermen as well. Like, you know, these fishermen which are cutting their, uh, their fishing gears and just, you know, to release this animal, which is, they were just sensitized. What is next for them in the store for, from the government's perspective? So this is a question for everyone, you know, to, throw, to rethink about it, especially for those who are involved in, you know, coastal fisheries. In addition to that, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, own perspective is, you know, uh, navigating the marine conservation journey. It really involved, you know, a lot of challenging, like, you know, for uh, forcing with the fisher community for the collaboration, overcoming bureaucratic hurdles to secure funding, and, you know, to persistently, to keep, to remain persistent in, in communication with these fishermen without losing their interest and, you know, highlighting their efforts and in project advocacy as well. In short, for me, like considering my talk is that, you know, the memorable uh, moments surfaced through successful wildlife releases, the community's adaptation of sustainable promoting and helping us, you know, promoting sustainable fisheries. At the same time, you know, it is really encouraging to see that, you know, they have a good catch, which ultimately contributes to their livelihoods by the end of the day. So these milestones underscore the impact of conservation efforts and reinforcing the significance of ongoing you know, dedication of, uh, to safeguard the marine uh, ecosystems. To rightly answer your question, sorry if I talk a lot, uh, I think, yeah, here. So this was the you know, most interesting part of my journey. Like, you know, I wasn't aware that you know, this fisherman, which is on the left, is basically one of the fisher communities. We supported them for the data collection and synthesized them for the data collection and reporting. On the back side, it's, you know, they, it, 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 they are their sons, basically. What happens, like, you know, after working with them for six months, like, you know, um, it was really interesting for me to, overwhelming for me to know that, you know, what we were, what they were doing on the back hand is actually, you can see that, you know, the, in the middle is my colleague, basically. They have invited us to their house. So this is the house of the bridal. So bridal are sitting on the back in the picture. So with this, you know, we were unaware that, you know, the incentives that we are trying to, you know, to give them, they were trying to, you know, to save them. And it com contributed to their, you know, in their happiness. So by those, you know, limited amount of their money, they were able to, you know, to, you know, to celebrate, you know, to let their, you know, sons to get married. And with this little amount of the, uh, of the money that we, we used, you know, to give them. So this was something like, you know, out of the context for me, being there and, you know, they have visited us there, that the 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 uh, the house of the bride that yeah, we are sitting there uh, and the photo is taken there. So ultimately, in the in the other hey, other way, how they were you know uh, thanking us, they thank us, uh, they express their gratitude. You know, in the, in the left picture is basically, and within their cultures and norms, like if you are you know handing over uh, any person or any lady with the traditional scarf, it is considered one of the precious things for them to honor you. And this is something that, you know, they're thanksgiving for us. So this was something that really really different. And our realm, like, you know, we are, we are working for the communities without realizing that, you know, their emotions, that, you know, we ultimately contributed in their happiness. So this is something, there was something, you know, interesting for me as well. Something to remember. Yeah. Over. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for your share. Uh, we see that on on though that uh, the journey with lots of challenges, but like still have lots of interesting and meaningful things uh, to discover and also like to explore. Uh, yeah, one more time, thank you so much for your efforts and your dedication. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's move to our next share uh, about community activities and campaign uh, for raising public awareness. Uh, we have Ms. Mary Jane Lamos, uh, like, uh, who impact on a meaningful journey to establish Tech Bay, Tech Bay, a circular economy initiative aimed at fostering women-led businesses in coastal communities uh, in the Coral Triangle region. Uh, the initiative upcycles old clothes and denim into marine theme plus toys, uh, raising awareness of life below water and empowering marginal 
uh, Medina Light women. Uh, so, Ms. Lemos, uh, if we organize some community activities and campaigns to raise public awareness, which activity do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. So, um, there are two ways of doing so. So, the first one is that um, you identify community issues surrounding you. You can either volunteer, um, start with that because you're still exploring which one would also fit your style. Like um, if there's a coastal cleanup and if you're really interested in doing it, like it's really easy. You can just show up and, you know, bring bring a plastic bag or they have, um, they have uh, collecting materials uh, for you already. And basically, that's like a one-time activity that has been done by most of um, people. You will meet people there. And that's the easy way of doing. And the second one is basically you start your own campaign. And um, that uh, that way is that you explore yourselves. You find a team. You find people. Um, in a way, you've already pre-identified which um, project or activity you want to do. So, for example, when I started um, Tagbi Tagbi, I've already I, the only um, notion that I did is that I really want to continue working in the marine environment, raising awareness, but not in research, like not in the field anymore, because it, I, am, I think that's not for me. That's a different uh, story. But basically, I've reached to the point that um, I've identified that um, my strength will be on um, basically providing opportunities for women. So what I did is I explore social enterprise. I don't have any business background, maybe like the, the business that we deal every day, like buying things, but that's out of the context. So basically you have to ask people around you, like how do, how do we even come up with a business proposal? How do we even come up with a project proposal? That's, um, the first, um, uh, I guess outline that you have to do when you want to raise a campaign and then with that you have to find people that can help you and once you have the people to find uh, when we have the people that can help me we have to prototype on ourselves so we have to teach ourselves learning how to sue learning how to create um, products with the themes uh, related to the ocean and then once we have that as, as our skill additional skills we um, reach out to communities we already uh, work with. So it's easier to um, do a campaign or a project if you already have a pre-existing relationship with um, with a community. It makes more sense to them that you're coming in with an idea. It's it's not easily accepted at all. It takes a lot of um, um, hours, a lot of talks, a lot of, a lot of um, you doing the things, seeing them, letting them basically we make the toys in the island and then we have like we pay them so that they are exposed it's more on like uh triggering their mind that okay we have this toy and then we show it to the tourists ask the tourists like how much are you willing to pay and basically once they hear like oh there's an opportunity on this and that's when they start asking questions so from asking question i think uh curiosity when once they start being curious of what you're doing that's when i guess you kick you kick off the project like okay let's do uh, the next level of like engagement now so it's a step by step you start from zero and obviously uh three years of working um like managing and doing tagbi tagbi we are still learning it's always there's like you're not growing if you're not learning so basically that's the concept of um um, a campaign may be like a short-term campaign or a long-term campaign. You always learn something new and definitely it's worth trying. Like there's no harm in um, in in trying rather than regret uh, that you didn't do it. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we also noted the insights from your share. Uh, yeah, and we keep learning and keep like, developing things. And we also love mm, tech free, tech free a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, how about you, like uh, Mr. Sensor Yasutu? Uh, if we organize some community activities and campaigns to raise public awareness, which activity uh, do you think that we should do? Well, this is one of the... Uh... 
questions that are also in the chat. Um, so I think from a, a robotics enthusiast perspective of view, um, I think that the student challenges uh, help a lot in order to raise some public awareness because um, the student teams, the young generation, the, the people, the future engineers who will be taking part in the future uh, is excited to join these, these kind of competitions because I've been there and people, people are uh, extremely uh, happy to take part in such uh, competitions and because it's, it's, a, it's a challenge uh, that challenges their, uh, their ability to develop something to, to uh, bring some solutions because you're not constrained to a single solution. Uh, you have sets of solutions and, and people can engineer their own solution and, and, and be really happy uh, to, to see how it is solve an actual work problem. Now the competitions that we, we are currently preparing for uh, may not be directly you know, linked to, to an underwater conservation uh, challenge, but, but I think eventually we'll, we'll uh, contribute to, uh, to that ideology. But I think having a, a, um, a competition that is specifically targeting for such fields will be extremely uh, useful and, and helpful to the community because, I mean, I personally would like to encourage the teams that I mentor to, to take part in such competitions and, and, and uh, help build a better future. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh for your share, also noted uh, amazing insights. And yeah, so let's move to the next topic. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Razak. Uh, so if you have an underwater conservation robot, how do you want it to help you in marine conservation? All right, thank you for that question. Uh, this is one of those questions which includes my interest as well. Because, you know, um, I think, you know, I've been working with the different, you know, uh, projects from, you know, wildlife, marine wildlife to the mangroves with the coastal communities as well. A few, a few years back that I had, you know, submitted a proposal to uh, UN, um, UN, you know, proposals about, you know, innovation. Unfortunately, it wasn't, you know, secured the funding. So the idea was that, you know, if I, by building on that, you know, proposal, if I had the underwater robotic, Definitely, I will explore the the corals community, which is uh, haven't studied yet in detail. Like we have it in two two spots uh, in, in Pakistan, and um, of course, yeah. So I would love to you know, to use that you know for those you know community for those in those areas where diving is considered as you know a risk or 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 as an obstacle as well. So if I had the robotics, I would love you know to use it with the belt up with the sensors of sensors you know, to de detect underwater chemistry to you know, to allow me to analyze the climate change impact by by by, by you know, altering the chemistry of the water within those ecosystems. At the same time, I would love to you I would love to see that you know robotic whatever the product it is uh, underwater or on or remotely monitored. It should be powered with the artificial technology, and it should allow me you know, to take the pictures at some spots by you know having GPS points, and you know to regularly keep monitoring the growth, identify the species, you know to uh, to monitor, regularly monitor their uh, health, and you know the change in it, especially for the bleaching uh, events as well. In addition to that, I believe that you know underwater uh, robotics also. Is a way to style and innovation, in a way to ways, you know, to uh, to be used uh, as a tool in marine conservation. You know, it can serve uh, serve a lot of efforts. You know, like you know, renting boat, you know, cylinders for the scuba divers, all the human efforts and risk is included in it. And it should be like when when it is equipped with the sensors and capabilities. I believe that you know uh, it will help. You know. It, it would help me you know, to have comprehensive uh, surveys, you know, uh, to you know to um, to look at the coral reefs, monitoring their health and the status, biodiversity there. It's not only the coral reefs; there are a lot of fishes as well. At the same time, I can use that robotics, you know, to collect the you know images of those sharks, especially in those you know hot spots, 
you need to keep taking, you know, the pictures which have the distinct, you know, uh, pattern within their body, you know, to collect and, and you know, contribute to the to the, those, you know, regional databases for um, for counting the uh, populations of the whale sharks as well. So, I mean that, you know, it depends, like, you know, what is the motive? And for me, it is like, you know, I would love to use it for underwater, you know, exploring underwater biodiversity, specifically for the, for the you know, um, and understanding the biodiversity and environment. Um, uh, so for example, you know, uh, if the corals are at risk or not or damaged, what are those human activities? What are those conditions there? So I would love to you need to explore it in that perspective. In addition to that, I believe that, you know, robotics could be used, you know, for collecting underwater garbages or the ghost gears at some point with a few limitations, of course. And uh, at the same time, it can be used, you know, to for the aquaculture of the coral reefs as well, you know, while planting them within the coral ecosystem as well. So there are a wide range of those, you know, different activities, but it is really a, a matter of concern that, you know, what do you want? What is your interest and what is the interest of your nation or other country that you, you want, you know, to, to use it? For me, I would love to use it, you know, for the, for, you know, uh, as a tool, to be used for monitoring the declared NPA and you know to, uh, to look at the conditions uh, of the underwater biodiversity and you know keep assisting assisting those underwater biodiversity in systematic you know uh, seasonal way. So this is these are my thoughts that if if I got it by Aladdin's you know <laughs> sorry definitely I will use it for these kind of activities. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Reza. Uh, well, not to, like, like from share, so, so uh, can raise for us more ideas from your own perspectives. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, and also for this one, uh, Mr. Roger Maslin, uh, if you have an underwater conservation robot, how do you want it to help you in marine conservation? Yeah, so um, as um, Sherv just said, the um, underwater robots can be used and will be used uh, for so many things going forward from the earlier talks you know just imagine it could be used to minimize bycatch but i know there are a number of projects around the world where they're putting multiple drones in um to effectively uh, take all the all the kind of measurements of water chemistry anyway from our point of view very specifically we use rov to really help uh, monitor the impact of our blue meadows program so this is three things. This is really just finding seagrass um, and uh, also then being able to um, uh, monitor and measure the impact of our of our restoration efforts. Um, and so what we've got is um, and I was really interested to see what sensor was saying. But here's our little here's our little uh, ROV. Um, it's incredibly accurate because it uses military technology. Uh, essentially what it does, it takes photographs of the seabed, stitches them together and creates a map. So we can basically use this ROV to be able to measure the impact of our restoration measures. And one of the things that we're trying to do is create a blue carbon credit um, as a way of funding restoration. Uh, one of the things you have to do is be able to prove to investors the amount of additionality that your restoration efforts are making. So how much additional seagrass is being uh, has been planted, has been grown. Um, so we basically use this technique to be, to be able to measure it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Maslin. Uh, also noted about your sharing uh, with amazing perspectives. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank all of our guests for the shares. Uh, thanks for your passions, your kindness that you are radiating to the community. Uh, when introducing this event to the community, we have received interesting questions uh, that they would like to hear answers from Cambria and our esteemed guests. Uh, we noted key questions, and now uh, I would love to invite our guests to share the answers. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have like the first five questions uh, from uh, Nabila Isham. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, Mr. Razak, yeah, the first question is like, uh, how is the latest status uh, of coral bleaching in global and where can I get or access to the data? Uh, please help to share the answer for this question. Thank you. Uh, 
I need you to share uh, to share my screen for that. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, well, um, how is the latest status of the bleaching and how they can get the access? Well, it is like, you know, um, it is, it's going to be a bit hard, you know, to stick on someone because there are uh, a lot of, you know, different organizations and uh, uh, which are working on it at the larger level, at global level as well. This is the list, like, you know, I can tell that, you know, uh, um, RGIS dashboard is also, you know, looking for the, you know, uh, coral bleaching events globally. They have their, you know, uh, interactive maps and data. And the graph to illustrate the current status of coral bleachings and um, where the users can explore the real time or historical data as well. So, at the same time, like you know, there's NOAA's coral reef watch, a, a reef base, a coral, uh, coral uh, global reef record as well. Well, uh, from Australian perspective, yeah, they do have the rural, uh, coral reef monitoring network, the Nature's Conservation uh, uh, Reef um, Resilience Network as well. So in line with that, you know, they have in a coral health atlas, integrated coral observatory network, Australian Institute of Marine Sciences. So these are the northern global uh, databases which are, you know, already you know monitoring that the impacts of the coral bleaching, you know, how it's how it's happening at, at which level. Well, I feel like you know among those, like uh, I'm just you know being neutral because you know, I love graphics and uh, for the graphics perspective, like you know, if there is a data, I would prefer that you know. So from the list, you can go and you know check out which is you know healthy for you depending on your interests and what you are looking for. And uh, in addition to that, I believe that you know our GIS dashboard for coral bleaching, you know, it it, it looks you know one of those you know important points as well. It can show you. Like you know, um, from you know, two hundred and thirty stations, you know, this shows the impacts graphically. You know what's happening at the same time. So they have you know interactive maps, as I said it already. You know, uh, you know, looking at the corals uh, bleaching events uh, globally. So it can give you real time or historical data. It depends on your interests uh, of different locations wide world. While answering the first part of the question. Uh, that the, the latest status is like you know it's mostly referred to the you know to the to the document uh, which is called like a 2014 2017 global coral reef bleaching event, which was in a third ever documented, and is currently on the record for the uh, as the longest, most widespread, and most damaging bleaching event, and you know which can, which says that you know the Great Barrier Reef along the other you know, reefs around the world, including the Caribbean and uh, Hawaii. They do experience global bleaching, and yeah, it, it, the, the, those you know, bleaching events are like you know more than seventy five percent of Earth's tropical reefs, which already experiencing you know um, bleaching levels, huge rates between you know, two thousand fourteen and seventeen, and, and that's you know nearly thirty percent of the reefs, and it's reached to you know to reach to the mortality levels as well. So this is what I can you know. Uh, can can tell that you know can refer that the document and uh, this the, the online databases. But I, I hope that you know answered the question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we also like have uh, one more question. Uh, yeah. Also, Mr. Razak, uh, like, could you please highlight like uh, the most severe bleaching of global coral reef and like how many percent or kilometers? If I, yeah, so interestingly, it's a follow-up uh, question. I, I think, you know, uh, the, the thing that I was looking at, like, you know, uh, two months ago is that, you know, it refers, you know, to the uh, to the article, which is published by, you know, uh, the news agency of Australia. And they said that, you know, in 2012, so their, their team has been, you know, looking you know, for, you know, they surveyed 91% of their reefs, you know, along the greater uh, barrier reef. So it's they, they, it says that you know severe bleaching events were reported to sixty percent you know of the coral along the five kilometer straight of the Great Barrier Reef. So this is on the top, which is which is being you know uh, considered as you know vulnerable because of you know some climatical uh, changes. 
and the other the other thing is that maybe you know uh, uh, this is what we we see that you know it is being reported but there's another uh, factor as well like you know so are we just you know referring this only the great bitter reef because it is already communicated on the internet or you know being communicated with the form of news what about those areas maybe there are some other areas where we don't have the access of monitoring of those areas as well so this is something that you know we need to consider as well so in addition to that i think you know most uh, coral bleaching events have been you know five times higher are more common wide uh, globally over the 40 years so we need to so the, the point is that you know it is not only the great barrier reef which is being vulnerable by losing the you know, coral communities, but you know, well, there is a there is a need of you know exploring or ex ex scaling up of those understandings or monitoring to other areas to understand the real uh, impact, which is which are happening to our you know underwater um, communities such as coral reefs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, your support to share the answers for these two questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so uh, we will move to the next question. Uh, I would love to invite Ms. Alamos. So the question is, uh, what is the best framework to create a marine conservation for coral reef in tropical sea lake valley in Indonesia? Mm, yes, um, I think what's the best framework that um, if you're planning to do it, I guess, is to look at the policy and the re regulation existing in um, specific country, especially like in Bali, because um, um, different, uh, even in Bali, they have like different, um, you know, restrictions, they have different, they're using different methods, different, um, I guess, technology. So by looking at the policy and regulation, you're, you are ensuring that, you know, you are collecting the right data, you are using the right methods of doing so, because it has been, I've worked with um, organizations, two organizations before, who was doing research on um, um, coral reefs, and basically two organizations were using different data, and then by the end of the day, none of them was used by uh, the government because it was not up to the standard. And definitely, I think in creating, you have to be... Um, you know, you consult with stakeholders. I think that's the most important part of doing so. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and yeah, and also Ms. Lamos, uh, the next question is like, who is the most responsible person to handle coral reef conservation? Could you please share your perspective? Um, yeah, I think uh, this question not only applies for coral uh, reef conservation, it applies to all um, activities we do for marine conservation. So um, uh, what I what I experience is that you uh, you based um, your how do you say you base your who are the responsible ones are basically, the people who have the local knowledge and the people who have the scientific knowledge. So this both goes hand goes hand in hand because um, despite um, having all these facts, all this um, data, by the end of the day, it's the community who implements. They are the one who are there. They under they are the one who experience the changes of the weather, the experiences like strong typhoon. So I think. All the stakeholders, including the government, they need to work on together to, you know, there's no such thing as responsible person. It's a responsible network of stakeholders working hand in hand to, you know, to save the coral reefs and do something about it. Yeah, thanks a lot for your support to share. Uh, yeah, so we will move to the next question. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Yasitu, uh, so from your expertise in robotics and technology, could you please share potential technological solutions or innovations that could help in preventing coral bleaching in the future? Yeah, um, so I think um, the, the key role uh, that the autonomous system uh, or like a robotic system can play a part uh, in, in such activities is that it is not constrained to only coral bleaching, but uh, again, uh, could be generalized for all types of conservation events, uh, either on, uh, on on like surface or the underwater environment. Um, I think the key role that uh, these will play is that 
they'll be able to do this 24 seven. I mean, if you have enough resources and the capabilities, uh, obviously um, people gathering uh, around and working on this 24 seven, uh, sometimes is not sustainable because um, all these events uh, also require some some funding in the background so that those people will keep up with their lives as well. But uh, this is um, this is a lot easier with with autonomous robots. And, and in order to be able to orchestrate them uh, together uh, and 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 complete a collaborative work, that's that's totally important. And and autonomous um, systems or like robot uh, robots in general are, are um, I think a lot better <laughs> than humans to complete such tasks because. Um, within within milliseconds, you instruct your uh, robots um, some commands to do certain tasks. Of course, um, this will require some uh, technical knowledge uh, to develop those kind of uh, robots. But once they they have been developed, uh, I think they can um, they can uh, execute the tasks uh, more effectively, and and so that. Uh, people can use such tools uh, to even reach deeper uh, environments because um, it, um, I think the second biggest uh, impact of those uh, robots will be that they can uh, reach uh, to to deeper depths or like they can reach to places where uh, the human activity activity would be dangerous for the humans as well. As well. Uh, so um, I think. I think robotics in general uh, is, is is a helpful resource to be able to um, build a, a better future for ocean environments. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for your share. We also really hope so. Uh, yeah, after the next question uh, is from Tri Wehu Uh I would like to invite Ms. Lian to share with us the answer. So the question is, uh, developing underwater robots requires a lot of resources and funds. How do we convince conventional conservationists that applying robots for marine conservation is more profitable, both in terms of finances and the effects on the environment itself? Well, thank you for the challenging question. <laughs> so, uh, to answer this question clearly but shortly, uh, I would like to give um, a specific example from one of the problems we are aiming to solve, which is like uh, what we have been sharing, uh, the coral reef conservation. In this case, actually, the need for a robotic solution came from the uh, conservation list. And the main reason here is to uh, speed up the work. As we share in the presentation, the world has lost 50% of its coral and projection up to 90% by mid-century, and their recovery can take years to decades. Uh, the coral reef are home to 25 of marine species, and they offer potential medicinal resources for ailments like uh, cancer and infection. So if we can speed up coral reef conservation, we can foster more marine species and medicinal resources which are essential to our human life. I hope that uh, this answer is uh, convincing to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ms. Lin. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Ms. Lin, and our guests for sharing all of the answers for our amazing questions. And this is so like a uh, challenging. Uh, yeah, uh, now Kimberly would like to share our next milestones. Uh, the milestones for underwater conservation robot down next year include uh, on July the 8th is step team proposal submission. August the 16th is online data launch event with key points including uh, the DAP teams will present proposals and receive Q&A from the community and experts. And we will also kickstart the fundraising on XDAO and share how to dine. And on August the 23rd, it top can sell uh, like Alpha King Hinge for the first product cycle and Ocean Explorers NFT collection sell. Yeah, so one more time, uh, we would love to send sincere thanks uh, to our beloved guests and participants that accompany us and share lots of interesting and inspirational stories. Thank all of you for joining the info session today.
Uh, we hope for a positive initiative and aim to contribute to the journey of safeguarding marine life. Please join Discord, uh, like our Discord channel, for more updates and discussions. If you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we really, really hope that you have such a great time. Have a good day or a good night. Uh, thank you and goodbye for now. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Goodbye.